African American Studies uh, within the College of Science, College of Arts and Sciences. Its purpose is to focus on Africa as an important site of knowledge by highlighting teaching, research, and publication work by Syracuse University scholars in the arts, humanities, social and natural, natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, and others. The initiative aims to revitalize interest in Africa, which has been on the wane in many institutions of higher learning since the end of the Cold War. In this respect, it is important to note that Syracuse University once had a vibrant African studies program. Although notable resources accumulated during its existence, such as the East African collection at the Burt Library remain. Moving forward from this history, the Africa Initiative is building upon its previous experience while charting new directions, uh, including offering a significant pool of experts specializing in various aspects of this diverse and richly endowed continent. The Africa Initiative's presence in the Department of African American Studies reinforces a critical site where most academic work on Africa at Syracuse University is done and where the continent and the Caribbean are perceived as concomitant parts of the department's Pan-Africanist vision. In bringing together Syracuse University scholars from various disciplines, the African Initiative not only promotes interdisciplinary exchange, but also reinforces the university's ongoing effort to diversify and internationalize the educational experience of our students. As such, the initiative places great emphasis on study abroad programs in Africa, as well as the provision of financial resources to give students exposure to that continent. By providing an alternative vision and platform for constructive discourse on Africa and African peoples, the Africa Initiative is helping alter the dominant perception of Africa as a, as a continent ridden with perpetual crises and despair. We want to break that. Now we have some events lined up uh, for this fall semester 2021. And please, you will be receiving some, you will see some sign up, sheet, sign up sheets in this room and you will be receiving some invitations. Kindly sign up when you receive those e-invites and let us participate in building this great mission. Now, before I introduce our speaker for today, let us recognize the board members. So the directors of Africa Initiative that are in the room, uh, let's uh, identify you very quickly. Just raise your hands for us and say hello to all of us. Professor Campbell, let's start with you. Uh, excellent. I'm the co-chair okay. co with Professor Kofi. I'm from the Department of African American Studies and the Department of Political Science. Thank you. Uh, Professor Smith? Hello, I'm Danielle Smith. I'm a faculty member in the Department of African American Studies. And the director. Of the honors program. Excellent, excellent. We thank you for being here. Uh, in the room also, I guess I introduced myself already, right? No, I'm at the Whitman really. School. Uh, I teach financial reporting and I love corporate governance as well. So I do that a lot on campus and across the country. We have a wonderful newest member of our board. He, she's going to be our speaker for the day. So there, just give us a wave. We'll see the rest of you for tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Online with us, we have Professor Roy Campbell. Uh, I'm not sure if she'll be able to talk right now, but we would love to hear from them if possible. Uh, she's also on our board of directors. And we also have Professor Shanguya who is online. At least I heard from the two of them that they are online. They texted me. At the and Brie Francis. Oh, uh, Professor Francis is on there as well. Wonderful. She, uh, he has been helping us a lot from ESF. So we appreciate the involvement. Uh, we have, uh, who are the, okay, Joanna Masangila is probably not with us, unless I don't She's see this semester. Okay, uh, there are some excuse absences. Herb Ruffin from the African American Studies right here. His office is across the hall. And um, Peter? Peter Castro. Peter Castro. I know I'm missing one that I wanna mention. Did I catch everybody? I hope I did. 
if I didn't, I will take the sacrifice. Now for the rest of this evening, so that we can save about 20 minutes extra for her, Matea, and we usually call her Mati, Sarek Behan, is a political science PhD candidate. Candidates, not just the students. Congratulations to her. She recently completed her Master of Arts in Pan African Studies program in the Department of African American Studies at Syracuse University. Her thesis explored the 2019 Sudanese uprising and the role of women and youth in organizing radically to subvert the state. Her research interests include African social and women's movements, grassroots mobilization, political organization, and African transformational politics and organization. She was born and raised in Ethiopia. She lived in uh, Malaysia before coming to the United States. She has worked with research institutions and a women's organization in Ethiopia. She is currently serving as a member of our board as I introduced her earlier. She also worked with an African Congress North American delegation. In 2017, Mahi also spearheaded Lynn County's uh, first expungement and resource clinic in Iowa which was meant to alleviate the disparate burdens faced by formerly incarcerated people. Today, she will present her perspectives from her research on ethnic nationalism, class struggle, and imperialism in Ethiopia. Please join me in welcoming Mahi to the center of today's event. And everybody who is here today, um, I appreciate you coming, and I'm glad to have a full house so that we can discuss the ongoing situation in Ethiopia. Uh, I do want to correct that this is not research based, but uh, I consider myself an African intellectual, and this is a high African analysis of the situation that is ongoing. Um, so, as mentioned, the title of my presentation would be Ethnic Nationalism, Class Struggles, and Imperialism in Ethiopia. So I'm sure that most of you have heard at least like the last few months, at least once have seen like a headline about something happening in Ethiopia. So this presentation is made to contextualize the situation and highlight these elements that aren't necessarily in mainstream media. Um, so first I will include a very brief history of the Ethiopian state in relation to the Ethiopian people. Um, so I'm no historian, but to understand the current context, we need to reflect on the past. Uh, I will then go into some detail of what happened since November 2020, uh, the humanitarian devastation and where we stand now. Uh, then I want to briefly move on to regional and international forces. Um, and I will close by explaining what is meant uh, by imperialism and my aspirations as a young uh, Ethiopian. So I'm hoping to provide an interrelated analysis of the local, regional, and international, and hoping to create discussion afterwards. So the Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia and the Ethiopian state has a long history of over 3,000 years um, and as one of the oldest civilizations in the world and as one of Africa's oldest independent countries. Um, so you see a timeline on your um, right over there. So you feel free to follow that. A common thread throughout all the periods on that timeline is the class struggles in Ethiopia enmeshed with ethnic oppression. No matter the nature of the state, there have been periodic uprisings and resistance the forms and groups have changed uh, depending on the period, but the central issues have remain, remained the same. Uh, some of those essential issues include land rights, um, ethnic targeting, and systemic oppression. Uh, since the feudal period, the questions and concerns of the Ethiopian peasantry, which has and remains to be the majority Ethiopian class, has not been answered. Uh, we are now a country of 110 million people, the second largest in Africa. And regardless of the double digit growths recorded over the last few decades, majority of Ethiopians live without access to clean water, electricity, housing, infrastructure, and other things we consider basic human rights. So from 1930 to 1974, uh, Ethiopia was under a feudalistic system led by Emperor Haile Selassie and mainly an Amhara elite ruling class. Uh, historically, the monarchy and the church have held considerable power in Ethiopia. Emperor Haile Selassie is revered at home and abroad, 
Um, but during his period uh, of school, the oppression of nationalities and the exploitative feudal system under his rule created mass discontent. And so that mass discontent uh, by the late 1960s and 1970s formed what we call what we know as the student movement, organized under the main slogan of land to the tiller. So by 1974, the student movement broke out as a student revolution. Ethiopia underwent a resolution. And I stress the word revolution because of the radical changes that happened initially during that time, uh, like the distribution of land and property, like the nationalization of industry, uh, a mass education program. Um, but like many revolutions, differences arose between different factions of the revolution and made way for a brutal military regime, um, which ruled Ethiopia for about 15 years. This period also signifies an attack on the Ethiopian intellectual and artist. Um, so during the reign of Mengistu Haile Mariam, uh, ethno-regional struggles continued. Uh, you had groups from Gambela, Amhara and other places staging resistance. Uh, some of the most well-known resistances came from Somalia, which manifested as the Ogaden War. Uh, and then you had the Tigray Liberation Front, TPLF, and the Eritrean People's Revolution Front, which were some of the more better organized organizations. So by 1991, uh, TPLF took control of the capital and removed the military dictatorial regime. And EPDRF came in as a coalition of the Oromo Democratic Party, the Amhara Democratic Party, the, the Southern Ethiopian People's Democratic Movement, and TPLF. Uh, most of these other sister um, parties were mainly formed by the TPLF, and the TPLF maintained a dominant force in the party, in the coalition party. So because of the concerns and the demands of the people at large, uh, EPRDF spoke the language of self-determination. It instituted ethnic federalism. It crafted the new constitution, which included Article 39, which gave Ethiopia's ethnic states the legal right to secede. Um, it is important to highlight that the ruling class that consolidated power after the revolution, after the armed struggles, and the popular right uprisings in Ethiopia had to address the calls of the people. Um, and ethnic federalism was just a response to the struggle at the current period. Um, so to explain TPLF led EPRDF's rule from 1991 to 2018, and why this presentation poses ethnic nationalism as a mask to obscure class struggle, I want to use this excerpt from Archie Mafejic's The Tribal Ideology. So, it reads, and I quote, um, this is not to deny the existence of ethnic ideology and sentiment in Africa. The argument is that they have to be understood and conceptualized differently under modern conditions. There is a real difference between the man who, on behalf of his ethnic group, strives to maintain its traditional integrity and autonomy, and the man who invokes ethnic ideology in order to maintain a power position, not in the ethnic area, but in the modern capital city, and whose ultimate aim is to undermine and exploit the supposed ethnic peoples. The fact that it works, as is often pointed out by ethnic ideologists or tribal ideologists, is no proof that tribes or tribalism exist in any objective sense. If anything, it is the mark of false consciousness on the part of the ethnic people who subscribe to an ideology that is inconsistent with their material base and therefore unwittingly respond to the call for their own exploitation on the part of the new African exploitation. So on the part of the new African elite, it is a ploy or distortion they use to conceal their own exploitative role. So um, upon entering uh, the capital and uh, resuming power, the TPLF led EPRDF disbanded the Ethiopian army and uh, created its, uh, a new national army and other security apparatuses, including a uh, federal police force and an intelligence agency, all of which were mainly dominated by TPLF elite. Uh, and this form of political dominance uh, allowed or facilitated the economic dominance of the ruling classes. So federalism was only in name because economic and political power remained centralized. Uh, the TPLF and ruling elite designed ways to use the state to accumulate wealth. Uh, in fact, as some of the numbers you see on your screen, uh, by 2015, a UN report on illicit financial flows showed an accused TPLF led Ethiopia, the TPLF led EPRDF government of stealing more than 30 billion worth within the time in power. Uh, there were state institutions built to funnel money to individuals. And one of those uh, institutions is EFFORTS, uh, which is the acronym for Endowment Fund for the Rehabilitation of Tigray. 
it was formed to rehabilitate the region because it had the region has seen a lot of war uh, during the, the armed struggle. So it is an umbrella company for a group of businesses which are involved in major industrial activities, which range from banking and insurances to communications and media uh, to mining sector and others. The CEOs and the general managers of these companies remain the top officials of the TPLF. Uh, the initial capital was under a uh, the initial capital was around 100 million US dollars, and by 2017, it had reached $3 billion in paid capital. So, um, TPLF also provided what you would call seed money to other endowment funds in other regions with the, uh, with the sister political parties under the EPDRF uh, coalition group. So, you had uh, one in Oromia, you had one in the Southern Nations, Nationalities, and Peoples region, and you had another in the Amhara region. In Oromia, it was the Tumsa Endowment Fund. In Amhara, it was Teret. And in SNNPR, it was Wendell. And, and all were led by senior officials in the earlier mentioned sister parties that made up the EPDRF. EPRDF. So it is important to note, however, uh, the combined numbers of companies run by these three endowments uh, were less than 20, whereas the companies under effort were uh, numbered to be 24, and some other numbers reflect over 300. So uh, efforts particularly created more than 47,000 deployment opportunities in Tigray. And this perhaps is the indirect way the TPLF benefited the working class in Tigray. In comparison, Tarat, the Amhara counterpart of efforts, employed 2,800 people. So not to mention that some of the, the, some of the largest and poorest regions in Ethiopia, mainly the Somali, the Afar, Belishangul Boom's region, and Gambela regions, did not have any endowment funds to deal with their uh, histories of war torn um, periods. So another, another um, organization that's up there is Metek. It's not an organization. It's, it was Ethiopia's largest company before it was disbanded. It was a military-run industrial conglomerate with 98 companies. Two of them manufactured uh, military equipment, where the rest manufactured things ranging from TVs to plastic products. So these are uh, the way the way this was the way how the state was used for capital accumulation uh, because Metek was, for example, was given large uh, state uh, projects. So aside from these large schemes of exploitation, uh, land grabbing in the name of development, uh, massacres in both the Amhara and Oromo regions occurred. Uh, you had war crimes and crimes against humanity in the Ogaden region. You had the suppression of the peoples of Afar and Gambela. You had fraudulent elections. Uh, and you had the suppression of Oromos in response to their struggle for self-determination, which technically was legal under Article 39. So these are the contradictions that um, ignited organized protests in 2014, but particularly in 2016, we saw national protests capitalized by uh, Oromo youth who are referred to as Ero, spreading from the Oromia region to the Amhara region and other Ethiopian regions. Um, I want to say like a seldom mentioned story is that when the Ero, the Ero youth uh, went out on the streets, uh, one thing we saw was that the Fano youth, which is a term used to refer to the Amhara youth, joined them in solidarity and by interlocking their struggles. Um, so in addition to all of these uh, contradictions happening, there was an internal political struggle. So the ousting of the TPLF uh, from power came in 2018. Uh, after Prime Minister Haile Malam Desale, who had led the EPRDF after Melody Zina's death, uh, resigned from his position, Abe Ahmed was appointed his successor. So it's kind of essential in my presentation to emphasize that Prime Minister Abe came to power through the people, including the Tigrayan people, who welcomed him cheerfully back in 2018. The Prime Minister's initial reforms included making peace with Eritrea, uh, better relations with Somalia and other uh, countries in the Horn, a recalling of exiled political groups and individuals, promoting press freedom, and initiating the Green Legacy Campaign. Uh, the Prime Minister has also been, um, so the Prime Minister has also been establishing neoliberal policies, uh, which, we, which we are yet to see genuinely having helped the majority of the peoples living in any of the global South countries. So by neoliberal policies, uh, I mean privatizing of Ethiopia's telecom sector, opening uh, Ethiopian airlines to foreign investment, and permitting companies like Volkswagen to come in and exploit workers for cheap labor. Uh, in some ways, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed seems just as nervous as the TPLF about the mass mobilization we have seen in Ethiopia over the last few years. I say this because there are times he has condemned peaceful mass protests in regions like the Amhara region, 
And he has also jailed political opposition leaders such as Jawad Muhammad and his Kindur Naga, who have been able to mass mobilize the youth and their international networks. So with cases of corruption lodged against companies like Metek, Peace with Eritrea, and these other reforms happening, the TPLF had retreated to that But in 2020, the TPLF rejected the postponement of the national elections due to COVID and had their own elections by September 2020. After that point on, both the uh, federal government and the TPLF uh, declared one another as illegitimate. So on November 3 uh, and 4 of 2020, the TPLF launched a number of pre-planned attacks on the Ethiopian National Defense Forces' most heavily equipped military bases in the Northern Command. And during the attacks, they took much of the command's military equipment, detained its forces, and killed hundreds of soldiers. Uh, by November 2024, uh, Abiy Ahmed officially declared war on the TPLF, and a six-month state of emergency was instituted in the Tigray region. At this point, Abe Ahmed also rejected calls for dialogue by the African Union and stated that there will be no negotiations. Um, there are many instances between November 2020 and the June 2021 unilateral ceasefire. Some disputed, but ended up escalating the war. Uh, the TPLF and the government of Ethiopia and their respective allies have accused and attempted to disprove one another continually. So, but <laughs> this presentation will not be regarding unverified and unconfirmed narratives. Uh, what has been clear, however, is the devastations that the military struggles are creating in all regions of Ethiopia. Like the narrative from which I began this presentation, it remains that it it's those that have been most exploited and most oppressed that continue to be most harmed by the ongoing war in Ethiopia. The war has become ethnicized and brutal uh, since the Maikadra massacre, to the indiscriminate shelling in Humara, to the most recent discoveries of mass graves and bodies floating in the rivers, the Ethiopian people are dying in scores. And ethnic and pan-nationalist, ethnic and pan-nationalism is being used to justify and mobilize their deaths. Um, so some of the some of the numbers I'm going to give you are reflective of the images you see on the slide. Uh, nearly two million Ethiopians have been internally displaced due to the conflict, and those numbers continue to rise. About 10 million people across Ethiopia are in need of humanitarian assistance. Many do not have access to functioning banks, electricity, uh, internet, and phone communication, especially in the, specifically in the northern region. Uh, lesser known crimes and atrocities are occurring simultaneously, including the killing, rape, and theft, and forced starvation of Eritrean refugees within Tigray. Uh, you have raiding of refugee camp offices in Tigray by TPLF militia. You have atrocities committed on Amhara civilians by Oromo regional forces and separatist groups in the Benishangu Gumuz region. Uh, you have brutality infected on Oman civilians. civilians. Uh, you have killings of Oromo activists and militarized government opposition by Ethiopian troops. Uh, you have other groups which are much smaller in number, like the Konso, being targeted ethnically, but we don't hear about it. Um, so you also have targeted arrests and closure of businesses of ethnic Tigrayans and Adjis Ababa. Um, Aside from that, there is conscription of underage youth. There is conscription of farmers happening. More than 7,000 schools have been fully or partially damaged by the conflict in the Northern region, which puts almost 1.4 million children at risk of not attending school. And all of this is happening in the, back, in the backdrop of COVID-19, locust swarms, the last two months being harvest season. You have a refugee crisis in the Gulf and repatriation of more than 40,000 people. Uh, from that region since June 2021 alone. Uh, there is huge economic inflation and youth unemployment is a growing concern. Uh, and during my time in Ethiopia, um, so I went in June, I was there, I assume. And so, and I came back in August. Within that time, the, the price of onions almost doubled and onions are like a basic necessity for any Ethiopian dish. So you can assume the, the dire direness of the situation in Ethiopia. So next, I want to talk about a little bit about the regional and international context. Uh, initially, the chairman of the African Union Commission, uh, Musa Faki Mohammed, had said Ethiopia took legitimate military action against Tigray and to preserve its own unity and stability. Uh, AU's former chairperson, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, had appointed three former presidents as special envoys for peace negotiations. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, the AU had asked the government of Ethiopia to remove the label of terrorists from TPLF so that negotiations can be held. 
uh, the G7 on the the G7 has expressed concern over the crisis in Tigray, while countries like China, Russia, uh, and organizations like the AU and EGAD um, have maintained a position of non-interference and a possible solution, an internal resolution for the conflict. Uh, and just today, I don't know if you guys have been catching the news, there have been sanctions, sanctions put on by President Biden uh, on Ethiopia. Um, I'm, the sanctions are broad sanctions against any of those people who are involved in perpetrating the ongoing conflict, so it's rather vague. Um, but I got this little expert, which a senior administration official told CNN uh, reporters that, and I quote, the Ethiopian government, the Eritrean government, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, and the Amhara regional government are threatened with these sanctions so that they may take meaningful steps to enter into talks for a negotiated ceasefire and allow for unhindered humanitarian access. Uh, but these sanctions do not seem to take into account, first, how or why the mentioned groups are involved in the war, uh, or doesn't take into account the unilateral ceasefire uh, that happened in August and was rejected by the TPLF. Um, so in that light, uh, there, TPLF and U, the <laughs> EPRDF and, TP, and the US administration allyship stretches back as back as 1991. Uh, and considering the geostrategic uh, position of the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia's location in terms of access to the Red Sea, the Middle East, and other uh, uses, the TPLF has been a useful ally in the region for the U.S. Uh, in 2009, Suzanne Rice served on the staff of the National Security Council and later as Assistant Secretary of State for the African Affairs. And under the Clinton administration, she teamed up with Prime Minister Malik Zainawi to get sanctions placed on Eritrea. Those sanctions have been proven to have harmed Eritrean people uh, severely. And then again in 2006, uh, TPLF led EPRDF invaded Somalia at the behest of the US. So there's really no surprise in terms of the kind of uh, uh, support Susan Rice or, and, other, or, and other politicians, some politicians in the US have been making. Uh, so the government of Ethiopia has also been facilitating the presence of AFRICOM in the region and providing troops. So the TPLF had proved to be a strong ally for the US administration. Uh, so in relation to the last words in the title, imperialism, um, I wanted to narrow it down to two main points. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about media misrepresentation and the politicization of humanitarian aid. Um, so we have learned from the experiences of Libya that the process of manufacturing consent through media campaigns and manipulation of information has been used to serve Western interests. Uh, so the government of Ethiopia has lost the war on media almost since the beginning of this war. In fact, I would accuse the government of not providing enough information to counter the misinformation. Um, so Western media and Western journalists have a lot to answer for. Uh, from the start, without necessary da data or preliminary research, and I'm talking about the first few weeks of when this war had started, there were labels of war and genocide uh, and there were established clear lines of antagonist and protagonist in the stories published in mainstream media. Um, secondly, as you see on your right, um, renowned newspapers like the New York Times inaccurately reported and used data. And when it was forced to correct it, they did so without, necessary, without the necessary acknowledgement. Uh, and then third, you see things like the misuse of images, like the one you see the young children over there. Um, I think this image is actually a children, a, a picture of children in Wendo in the Mahara region, but it was used by CBS in an article about an impending hunger crisis in the Tigray region. And last but not least, you have academics uh, like this person here, uh, who is, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Jethiel Tronohol, I assume, uh, who have inflamed and mischaracterized information. In this particular tweet, he says that the government refers to Tigrayans using genocidal language, but the Amharic version is clear about who the government is referring to and when what cultural context that is being said. Um, so my next point is on the politicization of humanitarian aid. Uh, first and foremost, like the European Union had been pushing for a UN resolution, and there wasn't really a lot of uh, a response from the, uh, the government of Ethiopia in terms of having negotiations. So the EU threatened to cut off roughly $100 million of aid to Ethiopia if the, the government did not com commit to the ceasefire. Uh, and then second, um, you have aid organizations that have been suspended in, I believe, in August. Uh, you have MSF Poland, you have the Norwegian Refugee Council, and Al-Maktoumi Foundation, who were suspended by the government of Ethiopia 
for working without for working uh, outside of their mandate for employing unauthorized foreign nationals and for legally importing and using satellite equipment. Um, and then you have the role of US aid. Uh, the, the writing you see on your complete right is an article, it's an old article on the New York Times, but US aid had been previously accused of plotting for regime change in countries like Cuba. Uh, and in the case of Ethiopia, they have also engaged in the manipulation of information. Uh, and they have echoed calls by the TPLF. Uh, for instance, TPLF had requested access uh, to humanitarian corridor through Sudan under the guise of humanitarian access. But the, technically, the closest port to Tigray is the Masawa port in Eritrea. The second closest one is the Djibouti port. And then the last one would, would be the port of Sudan in Sudan. So I want us to think about these contradictions, like what is being demanded from the government of Ethiopia? Why and how? Uh, and then I want to like ask questions like when there are reports of 93% of aid trucks entering Tigray, but not returning, what does unfettered humanitarian access mean? So how do we envision self-determination? Um, so as I come to my conclusion, I thought this slide would be a nice uh, coalition of everything that I said. Um, so when I was in the summer in Ethiopia, a lot was going on and partly like there were land disputes. So I was trying to find um, an, an old map of Ethiopia, right, for TPLF and for the highest lesson. So uh, what I came up with, like I came across this uh, document you see on your right. It was a 1992 hearing um, before the Subcommittee of African Affairs in the House of People's Representatives, which was held exactly like literally 29 years ago today. Um, so how serendipitous. Um, so the hearing included uh, addresses by American politicians, researchers, and Ethiopian at Howard, uh, and representatives of the Oromo Liberation Front, OLF, and the Olamhara People's Organization, AAOP. Now I'm talking about this is in 1992. So at, this, at that time, the TPLF under the EPRDF was in power, and the two groups, the OLF and the Amhara, Olamhara People's Organization, at this hearings, accused the TPLF and its coalition of parties under the EPRDF of the disregard to universal declaration of human rights, targeted ethnic cleansings and suppression of opposition, uh, unfair elections, and the installment of the Tigrayan uh, party elite in different offices and important offices. So I wanted to include it into my presentation today because it allows us to understand two things. First is that ethnic nationalism and ethnic federalism in Ethiopia has been superficial since its inception, yet it has been legitimized by men like Herman Cohen to your left, who was at that point the Assistant Secretary of State Bureau of African Affairs, who responded to the accusations of OLF and AOP by saying, uh, when asked about, oh, what should the judicial reform, when will that happen? He said, uh, their hands are full, they being TPLF, and they probably haven't been able to get to it. And he said, let us give them time. Um, so the second thing this document allows us to see is with increased and mobilized efforts by Ethiopians at home and abroad, to self explain, uh, explain ourselves and appeal to the US and its statesmen, uh, I want to use the entirety of this document to highlight that 29 years ago, we were doing the same thing, but not much has changed. Not that I do not think diplomatic efforts are important, but that I think that we may, be, we may have distracted ourselves of the historic allies Ethiopian people have had. So in 1935, Ethiopia was invaded by Italian forces. And this is what Robin G. Kelly had to say about what followed. Indeed, every self-respecting Black activist, irrespective of their national origins or ideological bent, joined the Ethiopian defense campaigns. Literally dozens of organizations were formed throughout the world to raise money for relief and medical aid. And Black men from the Caribbean, the United States, and Africa volunteered to fight. And this works true even in terms of the intellectual might that came out of the Black world in the diaspora. Um, so, I urge Ethiopians to reconsider who has been a genuine ally to the people of Ethiopia. Many organizations, such as the Black Alliance for Peace, the Pan African Congress North American Delegation, the Horn of Africa Pan African Liberation and Solidarity, have come out with statements. They've come out with reports. Um, and so I urge us to look to them when we want to appeal, when we want to explain. Then we have groups like Black Lives Matter who are struggling, an iterated version of the struggles of Ethiopian youth. Are facing today. I think such groups, including all peace seeking people of Ethiopia, or all peace seeking people in the world, should be our primary allies. Um, lastly, 
the images you see is of the mass mobilization in Ethiopia. So I do not want to end without reflection on the sheer greatness of the reawakened mobilization and vigilance of youth in Ethiopia. But I do urge us to go beyond nationalism. Um, so to my fellow young Ethiopians, I share with you a quote by Franz Fanon. Each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. And to global Africans and peace-loving people of the world, I use Andaye's words. We need first to identify the world we want to build, not in the old language of isms, but in the new language that has clarity and purpose. And that's it. Thank you. That was great. Now we're going to allow plenty of time for questions, and we might finish. Uh, yes, please, let's go for the questions that are in the room. Uh, just before you start, may I just take this opportunity to mention for, uh, for those uh, online, please go ahead and put your questions in the chat room. But if you trust your audio system, we will call upon you and we will ask you to unmute and speak out your questions. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Benjamin Tete. I'm from Ghana. Um, I'm a current PhD student in Newhouse, majoring in public communications. Um, thanks, that's very insightful. Uh, I have two questions, if you will, but um, first is your. Um, when the conflict, of course, we were all following on what the media was reporting. And of course, as a person in media and communications, I have a lot of interest. So I wanted to uh, first ask the initial impressions was more of, and indeed, at the point the UN warned, the international community was warning that what was going on in Tigray region was heading more towards a genocide. I think you sounded like you questioning or criticizing that point of view. I wanted a bit of clarification because indeed, I remember New York Times, for instance, had a reporter, which interestingly was an Ethiopian and was on the ground. And some of the images of police um, mass killings, it was horrific. So I would like your view on that. And then secondly, uh, you, refer, you refer to the African Union. How do you see? It looks like African Union somehow hands are tied because, of course, the whole African Union team sits in, in Addis, and then this is happening in their home country. Um, I'm glad that you brought it into focus and you mentioned it, but I would also want what you thought probably the AU could have done differently, and also looking at the fact that Ethiopia is basically hosting the AU. Um, what do you think the AU could probably do differently? Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Shabit Zaman. I'm from Benin Republic. I'm a scholar. Right now, I'm uh, actually I'm a Humphrey Fellow at Masquerade School. So I have three questions. The first one is about: uh, Are you seeing that uh, the in the the external hands of Tigrayan conflicts, you know, in that area, like uh, the Tigrayans are supported by any neighboring countries? The second question is about the appointments of the Abiy Ahmed as a prime minister of Ethiopia, who is coming from the minority, the minority ethnic group, Omoro. So being there uh, as a prime minister, is it a symbolic or a, a appointment or maybe is a hope for this ethnic group you know, to be fully represented in Ethiopia? Because we know that the Omoro people, mostly they are like backwards in the political and social system in Ethiopia. And lastly, we all know that uh, Obama received the Prize Nobel of Peace in the US. And we all know what's happened in the Middle East when he received the, the prize. Hansan Suki also from Bamania received the Nobel Prize of Peace. Abiy Ahmed received the Nobel Prize of Peace. Do you think that we should withdraw, we should withdraw that prize from him? <laughs> yes. Thank you. So let me start by answering these four questions, I guess. And then we can. Um, so as for the classifications of genocide, um, you mentioned Benjamin, 
Um, so genocide is a very specific term used in very specific instances, right? So why I started this uh, talk today with a certain kind of uh, unobscuring of what is going on is in hopes that uh, we understand the, the real friction happening. As for the genocide, uh, there is, I mean, between since November 2020 and literally even yesterday, I was following up on the news just to see what's happened. The amount of information that is coming out and the scale of death that is coming out, um, it is not, you cannot call one side a culprit and the other a victim. There is so much happening on so many scales. So my answer to that will be, I would call it a genocide when we have researched on it, when we have seen the deaths are happening in different parts of Ethiopia in different ways. And so the term genocide itself comes with connotations and, and punishment or disciplinary measures that is used by Western interests. Why that is put out in the media is for a reason. So I don't want to reproduce that term just yet. Do I think there has been ethnically targeted killings and all that? I do. That is for sure. Um, as for what do you think the AU can do differently? Um, I think as all African states should be looking to the AU, uh, there's the A3 and the UN who has been supporting Ethiopia. I believe in self-determination. I think we should have an internal resolution. I think to, to, like, to answer the question, what should the AU do? I think uh, the African people have that answer. I think the African people should build the AU, should reinforce its existence because it is one of the only uh, multilateral organizations that have been built by us and for us. No matter its shortcomings, um, I think that is where the African people should uh, put their resources towards. Um, and then I'll come to you. Um, sorry, your name again? Shabi. Shabi, okay. Um, yeah. So Shabi, your first question is neighboring countries and so forth. Um, there's a lot of information that Egypt is supporting because there are many separatist groups aside from the PPLF functioning in different regions of Ethiopia right now. So there's many information coming out that Egypt is uh, uh, funding these separatist groups. There's also information that the Sudanese government is. Uh, but I want to make this distinction, like why Egypt and Sudan are not in my presentation today is because uh, the West normally uses, like I think a CIA report yesterday, not a CIA, but a USA report came out yesterday. And it talked about how potentially Egypt and Sudan can fund uh, these other groups but they're not doing it or they might be doing it. So I wanted to be like, who is funding Egypt and Sudan in the first place? So, you know, right now, I don't know, you can look up, uh, I forgot the numbers, but Egypt's military was funded by who? It's the, the US administration. Uh, so even in Sudan, uh, the people of Sudan in 2019, they showed us the struggle. The Sudanese people are our people, are my people, are you know, African people. The Sudanese regime, however, is something uh, that has been, uh, the military has had a major, you've seen a back and forth between civilians and the military. So uh, do I trust the military regime of Sudan? No, because even the people of Sudan did not trust it and wanted to remove it. Um, and then your last question of, should we uh, revoke the peace price from Abbey? Is that the question? Or no, the last, the last question is about uh, the price uh, given to Abi Ahmed, I say he's coming from uh, his Omor, yes? Yes, yes. Okay, and then the Omor, we know that the class struggle is like a, a caste system in India. Mm -hmm. So and then he's there as a, a, a representing the minority a, a caste or groups, but how comes that these, a, 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 these people are still marginalized under you know, his uh, leadership? Uh, well, yes. I, first of all, since Abi has been into power, there's been a huge internal political struggle amongst the elites in Ethiopia. And he was part of the EPRDF, so that is worth noting as well. Uh, it seems from the kind of statements he brings and the agenda he puts forth, he has a pan-Ethiopian uh, agenda and not necessarily uh, a representative one. Uh, and I would answer, my answer would be as the country of a nation with 80 different ethnicities, not four, not two, but 80, um, it would be wise for Abe Ahmed to represent all of Ethiopians if he was going to usher us into the next era. So it's mean that he's just there as a symbol, that's all. Well, as mentioned in my presentation, he came in through the people. So he, he was appointed by the, the current regime, but the people chose him um, okay, in some about, ways, indirectly. The last question about the price uh, number of the fees that he received. And then the saying that he will never negotiate with the Tigrayans. 
Someone who received a prize, Nobel Prize of Peace saying that no, there is no way to negotiate. So what do you think about it? Well, when you receive the prize, the Nobel Prize for Peace, so it means that you are a symbol of dialogue, mm -hmm. for negotiation, for mediation. But saying that no way to negotiate, just to listen to you. one year ago, even less than one year. So how do you perceive that one? Mm -hmm. Well, as you kind of mentioned, I don't think the Nobel Peace Prize and those who give that prize really are talking about peace. It's, I think it's a political uh, symbol because Obama got it and Sun Tzu Ki got it and their actions went. Uh, but aside from that, um, do I think he needs to uh, bring peace? He does. Um, how is that peace going to come? When I was in Ethiopia, I got to talk to different people. Um, why I ended it with that urge Ethiopians not to be nationalistic is that Many parts of our society are really polarized. Um, some people support what he's doing, some people are against it. But uh, just before we proceed, I just want us to interject something very, very important and find another opportunity to recognize the great work that is happening here at the African American Studies. So, Mr. Co Chair, please permit me to do this. Uh, and then we'll come back to the questions. So please go ahead and think about your questions. We have plenty of time for questions. But the African American Studies uh, Department has done great things. And the department chair is online with us, has been with us from the very beginning. We were just looking for more people to come here to uh, welcome her and introduce her. Professor Lois Agnew uh, is a distinguished professor at the university, and she's currently the acting department chair for the African American Studies. We'll give her a little chance to say hello to us. She's online. Thank you so much, Kofi, and greetings to everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be able to serve as interim chair of the African American Great. Studies Department this year and uh, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see such an excellent turnout. Thanks to the Africa Initiative Board for organizing this event and to my dear for the excellent presentation. I've learned a lot and I'm so pleased to be here with you and um, find these kinds of events so stimulating and exciting. And this is, this is just what life at the university should be like. So thank you for making this opportunity available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll get back to our questions. Uh, who might be next? Shall we ask the people on Zoom? Yes. Um, our friends on Zoom, please, uh, if you have any questions, you can. All right. Professor Martin, I think I see your question. Do you want to verbalize that now or do you want us to just read it here? We'd love to hear from you. Um, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering whether um, the speaker can elaborate just a little bit. I know she has uh, hinted a little bit at this question, especially within um, her introduction and um, a little bit deeper into her discussion. Um, the extent which class is uh, still a major contributing factor to uh, the conflict uh, in Ethiopia, especially within the current, uh, you know, the current uh, period, as compared to, let's say, you know, the role of resources and this sense, I'm thinking of land, uh, the land resource and uh, ethnicity. So what is the intersection there, um, you know, is, um, you know, the, the struggle to access resources, uh, specifically as regards land or any other resource, therefore, um, uh, as well as the role of ethnicity, much more implicit uh, in this problem, a national problem that Ethiopia faces or is class still prevalent as, is, as it is it used to be uh, in a long time ago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shangria. Um, well, I'm hoping that Professor Martin can elaborate on that class has always been an issue and that the same rights, whether it was during the feudal period, asking for land rights and land to the color, to now when the Ormond protest erupted, it was because there was land grabbing happening outside the outskirts of uh, Addis Ababa, the capital. So class has always been um, the underlying issue, um, but we have politicians, we have elites that use 
Um, and I will not, actually, class has always also been associated with ethnicity in Ethiopia during different periods. As mentioned, during Upper Hadassah period, for example, uh, with mainly an Amhara elite. Um, so, to your question of how important is class, I think class is the primary contribution in the Ethiopian case. And then to your uh, question of, is it a lack of resources? I think in general, it is a lack of, a, I think the best way I can highlight how class was such a, a, a is such an issue is that when Abiy Ahmed came into power, uh, he did like a national uh, tour of all regions, um, all regions because he preached, his, he, his preaching was peace, no more corruption, respect to people, uh, development, these were the things he, he ran his like basic first year campaign on. Like all regions jubilated, and I think for once, or uh, it wasn't a state induced protest, but people came out to accept him. And that shows you, regardless of different differences in our societies, that most of our societies are, and ethnic groups are looking for the same things, which is peace, uh, which <laughs> is wanting to like provide for their children a better life, uh, and these very basic necessities. Uh, and so another thing that also shows you um, the, the, the fact is, um, yeah, but I'll skip that. Yeah. And I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, you did. Um, can you just elaborate a little bit on who constitutes this class? Are you, I mean, is it is it the political elite or someone else? Which class? You mean? Uh, you are talking about the. I mean, we are mentioning, or you did mention about class struggle uh, uh, in Ethiopia, or the contribution of uh, you know the class, uh, uh, um, the, the 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 social differentiation yeah. uh, within so, Ethiopia and its contribution to you know uh, the dilemma, the historical dilemmas that the country has faced for quite some time. Now, in the modern sense, uh, who who are these that constitute this elite class uh, that you know, might be at the core of the problems that you're talking about. Are they are they the political elite, the economic elite, or who are those? Well, the political, as based on my presentation, the political mm -hmm. and economic elite for the last 30 years have been uh, coming from the same class. Uh, okay. As for the oppressed classes, 80%, more than 80% of Ethiopian population uh, remains a farmer. Uh, so you okay. have a farming agrarian uh, class uh, that is still the majority in Ethiopia. So okay. when you have the policies of uh, under the guise of development, of privatization and the likes, and uh, the kind of investments done by the state, it uh, mm -hmm. not only displaces farmers, but uh, it takes land away from them. It changes their social structures. Uh, and so these are, uh, in, my, uh, in my brief research and my opinion, these are the contradictions that have led to these manifestations now. And as for the... the yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's a quick question here. Um, it's a little too soon for you to assess the initiative that uh, pro, uh, President Biden is bringing today. Uh, but are you willing to give any prognosis on what it might do based on what you have outlined here today in the history of alliances that Ethiopia has had. Okay, so with the sanction, I tried to find documents, clear documents, but I mainly ended up reading just news articles by CNN, CNN and CBS. So it's a broad sanction against, like, so the statement is a broad sanction against anyone involved in perpetrating the ongoing conflict in Ethiopia. Uh, throughout the two things I mentioned with media misrepresentation and with the politicization of aid, it looks like the U.S. administration has been leaning towards one side, which happens to be the TPLF, whether it's by omissions uh, or whether it's by uh, uh, putting equal pressure on both groups when 